Yeah. I'm great. I'm <laughs> great. great. So for those of you who don't know who's saying hello, hello, that's Christy Friesen. And she is yes, a is. Uh, polymer clay and mixed media artist. She's very prolific with her tutorials and her art making. And we are featuring at craftylink.com a year long of yeah. creating along. <laughs> creating What's along, up? yes. And we're basing it off um, this book, which is Flourish. Yay. That's my favorite so far. <laughs> <laughs> and we are going to be doing some um, video demos and little um, things along the way with prizes. So yes. be sure that you get involved in all that good fun. But right now we're going to go ahead and do a 12 questions interview and find out all about Christy and her brain. All about me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Christy, go ahead and introduce yourself a little further. Uh, as well as you know, obviously, I'm Christy Friesen, and uh, I've been doing creative things since forever. Like most of you, as soon as you could pick up a crayon and draw on the walls, you started your creative journey, and that's me as well. And I'm very, very lucky to be doing this full time. Um, I know a lot of people just hope for the day when they can retire from whatever their real jobs are and play all day. And uh, I get to do that, which is wonderful. I'm very thankful and excited. It's a lot of work sometimes, but it's all fun. And I have a great great supportive family that uh, lets me pretty much get away with it so I'm a happy girl <laughs> and obviously I'm a polymer girl uh, that's my media of choice but to that I mix in lots of other stuff because there's so many cool things to play with in the world there so are. I guess that's sort of me in a nutshell that and I love <laughs> chocolate so that's pretty much all you need to know <laughs> yes what is that in your email signature about the chocolate. <laughs> uh, yeah, just in case, you know, anybody was like, boy, I have all this extra really expensive European chocolates. Who could I give some to? Ta-da, I just want to put that little bug in people's ear. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, so um, Christy, you live on the West Coast? I do. I'm in California in a town called Tehachapi, which is about two hours inland and slightly north of LA. And there's other, a couple of other polymer artists in the area, a number that enjoy polymer. So there must be something in the water because there's a lot of polymer folks here. But uh, Karen Lewis Clue also lives in Tehachapi, as does Erico Page, uh, two polymer artists of note. And then quite a number of other people that just enjoy. Uh, you might have seen Janet uh, Maven's work in Polymer Cafe a lot and a couple of others. So it's quite a polymer place. So it's, it's very exciting to have other people around that do what I do. Cool. So, okay, tell us what does being creative mean to you? You know, that's an interesting thing and probably something all of us folks that make things think about every now and again. And I think sometimes we can get a little like over in our own heads about it and try to analyze it too much. But really, I mean, anytime you have that impulse to just make something, I mean, cake, dancing, um, braid your hair cool. I mean, that's all creative. It's it's something that is not necessary, but makes life better. Mm -hmm. And I think that's sort of the creative part of all of us. And everybody has a different thing. Like I, I look at people who can do musical stuff, and I'm amazed at that creativity because it is not in my head. I cannot do that. But, you know, you give me clay or a pen or something like that, and I'm, I'm all over it. So it's just that sort of extension of yourself that mm -hmm. makes life a little bit more interesting. Don't you think? I do. I agree. I really think that creativity doesn't just mean I'm an artist. No. Know? Yeah, it's just any of those things. And, and I mean, you, you've you known people back in the day, the way they could put together a, a family meal was creative. <laughs> the garnishes they use and the spices and stuff. So, you know, everybody's got a different outlet, which is wonderful. I, I think it's the thing that makes being a human the most fun. Because, I mean, mm -hmm. everything else is just survival. And the creativity part is all the gravy and you know, all the icing on the cake to mix my metaphors. But it's just what makes everything much more tasty. So, <laughs> and I, I think sometimes people feel like, well, I'm not creative. All I do is crochet and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, cook and on and on and on. And I was like, well, yeah, you are. <laughs> you don't have to be in a gallery to be creative. Anything you do that adds a little joy and beauty is is counts. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I think that's great. So tell us about the moment, if there was one, in your life, you know, when you realized that being creative and creating was something that you absolutely had to do. 
You know, that's that's an interesting question, too, as are many of the questions that you have uh, for us to cover while we're chatting here. But, um, you know, I think probably a lot of us can go back in our lives and have little milestones of creativity. And I, I have some very early memories. Um, I think I was must have been created from very young age. Uh, because my mom enrolled me in a, of all things, an oil painting class when I was four. Hmm. Most of the class consisted of getting the oil paint off me. <laughs> at the end of each little session, I was just covered head to toe. And, you know, turpentine, I remember that vividly. But I remember it being interesting to be able to paint. And, uh, uh, and I remember then continuing in that vein, you know, being able to you know, draw things, and my friends would be like, hey, draw me a dinosaur. Okay, you know, I'll draw another. Draw me one. Now draw one with horns and wings. Okay. You know, so I remember a lot of those early times of having other people want me to draw for them because what I did was fun. And uh, that that kind of thing, I, I, I think those little early memories uh, of being creative like that are, are very triggered. And um, I think I've always known as long as I can remember that this was something that was a part of me that I wanted to do, you know, forever. Um, however, actually becoming a professional artist, although I've sold work my whole life, but there was a moment probably in my mid-30s when I had my little midlife crisis early, you know, get it out of the way. <laughs> and I just thought, you know, I don't want to be doing, you know, cleaning toilets when I'm 75. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but me personally, I don't want to do that. If I'm 75 years old, I want to be able to just push some things in clay and sign it and people would buy it. So mm -hmm. I thought, well, if I'm going to be able to be that, I better start now because nobody's going to want 75-year-old dumb stuff. They're going to want a body of work that they'll like feel sorry for me at 75 and okay, we'll buy that thing for them. <laughs> but, so I figured I better get started. So I think around in my mid-30s, I thought, okay, I was, you know, my husband and I have had our own business for years and uh, I, I was just like getting tired of that and didn't want to do this, you know, boring thing anymore thought I'm going to become an artist I've got to do this professionally and that sort of started my journey of just trying various things at a more serious level because mm -hmm. I've already always done little bits here and sold a little something there but that, that's when I got serious about it and found polymer clay not too long thereafter and just went nuts with that so um, but that was kind of my defining moment of like I really need to do this for real mm -hmm. And it's been ever since then, boom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that about when you um, started publishing in magazines? Um, I think my, my serious polymer phase of my life has been the last 10, 10, 11, 12 years. And yes, I think my first uh, magazine article was in 2003, I want to say. And that was the bead and button one with a, a fish. Mm -hmm. And that one just went nuts, um, which was great. I was just in the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I really advise being lucky. If you can work out being lucky once or twice in your life, that is really a good thing. And I was just lucky. It was um, it, it was interesting, different than what was out there, and it just captured imagination. So um, pretty much since then, people have been interested in what I've done. I've been able to write lots of magazine articles and books, and people have been in, intrigued by my style uh, mm -hmm. of doing things. Because I think polymer is all about, like, what's next? What else can we do? Um, where can we go from here? And it was kind of something that was a little different than what was out there. So I was, mm -hmm. you know. I'm very lucky about that, but yeah, right. that's that's when it really got in earnest of doing what I do now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember the fish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was it was neat, and it was one of those things where you don't know enough to know better, and that's sort of my <laughs> style anyway. I mean, you know, there's rules, and you sort of like, okay, I do this, and then I submit to here, and I follow my da da da. -da. But I'm just like, hey, button button, that looks like a good magazine. I think <laughs> I'll see if they want that. You know, instead of and I didn't do any of the things I was supposed to do. I just like wrote the editor and said, what do you think about this? And they said, okay. <laughs> Hey, that's great. So, you know, <laughs> I just happen to luck out that they, they let me slide on that one. But uh, that tends to be my style is just barge right in and then find out what you were supposed to do. Ah, yeah, well. Uh, it works for me. Supposed to. Yeah. Supposed to do. Come on. Supposed to do. I find out afterwards what I was supposed to do, but, you know. Mm -hmm. But it was it was nice, and I enjoy writing very, very much, as you know, by the yeah. books that I have out. It's that's a part of my creative journey that has been really satisfying for me, um, and being able to have people say, "I want more projects from this weirdo, and I want to read more of her goofy writings," has been wonderful because it allows me then to just keep doing the crazy that I do because mm -hmm. there's people that are interested in it. So, thanks all of you guys. <laughs> that's great. That's good. So, um. If there's ever, you know, a downtime or if there's moments when you need to inspire yourself, what yes. kind of creative rituals 
or routines have you created for yourself? You know, that this is something I think a lot of uh, creative people struggle with. Um, having, you know, writers have writer's block, so do musicians. And artists, of course, get in that where they can't figure out what to do. And I, I've got like a little story about this, and this will kind of lead into to the answer to this for me, is um, when I was about eight, my, my family was very artistic. Um, my mom dabbled in various things, and she always filled the house with a lot of artwork, and it was always important to her to have us kids take different art classes. So that was very good. And my dad was, I, it took me years to realize that he wasn't so much an artist as he was a collector of art materials which was great for me because I was a user of art material so there was always junk around the house you know all kinds of paper and and cutting machines and and we had screen printing stuff back early on where it was little handmade stuff and uh, paper mache with puppetry and on and on and on we just if if it was interesting it was in the house and we we played with it and I was the main player with and one day he decided that he had the same last name as some famous potter in the area so that therefore of course must mean that he's related therefore he's probably going to be a famous potter too right so he went and got a a, a a wheel and a kiln and all the clay and brought all this stuff home set up the kiln we were all just like ah, yay! so I remember the day when the kiln was all set the clay was there everything was ready and I'm at school like I can't wait for school to be over can't wait for school to be over I think I was about eight and um, we, I get home it's like I get to do some clay wow this is gonna be so much fun you know and I just sat there for like three hours and finally was in tears because I was there I was ready and I had nothing to do I could not think of a thing to make it everything I made was just basically ashtray lumps so I, at, at that moment I know that's kind of early for that to happen but that moment I realized that any time I had an idea I was going to jot it down in notebooks so that I would never feel this way again so that when I sat down to create I would be able to flip through all my little books and go ah that's the little bunny I want to make today or oh you know whatever and I, I remember being voracious because we we had a really great library in our town and I would go to the library all the time with my family and just bring home piles of books and look through everything and all kinds of genre and all kinds of materials and just so the ideas there's a lot out there and I remember that most of my early drawings were like ooh I like how that person made that badger I'm gonna draw that badger here and then I'll make that badger but then as you go on it's like well I like the nuance of color here and those lines here what if we combine this? You know, you get a little bit more sophisticated in your ideas. Um, but that's something I've continued ever since then. I have boxes and notebooks all around my studio that just are sketches and doodles and ideas and clippings. And of course, on the computer, I have the same thing. Pinterest boards full of stuff. Now pictures from all over the world. Anytime I'm somewhere and there's art and I have magazines galore and books galore, I flip through these things and it just sort of fills up my brain with imagery of what people have made in the past and those colors those lines those ideas all just kind of jumble in a big uh, little jambalaya in there so you can just kind of dip your dipper in and pull out some weird random creative stew bits and hopefully they segue you right into creativity but so far as like a ritual which I think many people do need because for most people you're not doing it every day you like have one day a month where you get to sit down for half a day and after you've cleaned off your studio area then you get to sit down and play for five minutes before you have to clean it back up again and make dinner which is not the ideal way of being creative but it's the way most of us are so um, the what I always do if I'm finding myself with a little bit of a um, stump is that I will just pull some of my clays out my clays are in a heap on my desk and they're by sort of rainbow colors I've got my reds my yellows my blues but in a heap they're not separated individually because <laughs> those colors I want them to touch and make a mess so I just take a little handful and run it through my machine and as those colors come out I start seeing the pattern seeing the colors seeing where it takes me oh this feels oceany maybe I'll make this in an ocean background or wow this is fiery let's make a heart with flames so just the the, the mixing colors sort of jump starts what I'm doing mm -hmm. Yeah, so awesome. that's kind of my ritual. And, you know, I would make sure I have snacks nearby because for most of us, once we get started creating, we just like don't reemerge until our bladder is full and we're fainting from <laughs> hunger. So I usually keep you know little snacks and things right nearby so I can keep my energy up in the meantime. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> yeah, that works. <laughs> A friend of mine once ate clay because she had <laughs> she had like a little thing of a little um, bowl of cubed. <laughs> on her desk and oh, it looked goodness. a lot like translucent clay so she oh. was <laughs> translucent in her mouth thinking it was Swiss cheese and oh my goodness and, uh, yeah, that yeah. could be a rude awakening I had a glass maker <laughs> friend of mine one time and he did this on purpose because he was a little bit edgy but he made himself a little bowl full of beads that looked like M&Ms 
and he put real M&Ms beside him. You know, mm -hmm. but you thought they were all the glass beads. So while he's demonstrating and talking, he just reached, you know, and before he had shown them the glass beads and everything, so people knew they were glass. So he's like, da 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 da, and he randomly just grabs M&Ms and pops them in his mouth. And you know how they crunch at first? So everybody's like, ah! you know, and he's like, ah, ha, 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 gotcha again. So that, yeah, he kind of played that one up a little bit more. <laughs> Oh my goodness! Uh, yeah. The little things we do to keep our <laughs> lives happy. <laughs> uh, so there's a caution for you with snacks on the clay table. <laughs> yes, keep your chocolate-colored clay and your chocolate in different areas of your table. Yeah. That's what yeah. I say. <laughs> oh. oh my goodness! So uh, it sounds like you had a really um, a life where you were constantly exposed to new art materials. Yes. Yes. So, yes. You know, our next question is, what medium would you like to learn but haven't yet? Ah, all of them. All of them. <laughs> They're like, everything is so exciting, and there's not enough time in a day. I wish I had one big, long studio, and that here's my polymer station, and my stained glass station, and my soldering station, and my metal station, and my enameling station, blah, 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 blah. Um, I think, obviously... Um, related to polymer is um, the metal clays and I find mm -hmm. them very intriguing and I know that I don't have the time yet to play with those but I would like to and enameling absolutely mm -hmm. intrigues me and of course the whole shebang where it's kiln fired and polished and that kind of thing um, I, I love the look of glass but I'm not tempted to try it because I'm so much of a fingers person mm -hmm. and so much of what I do so I, I will admire that one from afar <laughs> and just use glass in what I do um, mm -hmm. but you know I really do love 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 clay and most most of what I'm looking at with with uh, what I want to create all in, comes back to involving polymer in some way because I started early on, you know, being a ceramic artist and you know we had that kiln for years and years and I created a lot of things with that and I'm kind of I always go back to that touch but I'm kind of mm -hmm. lucky because I since I um, write. I'm able to not only do creative writing, but I'm, I illustrate all my books. So all the pit watercolors and pencil and pen drawings that you see, <clears throat> that's all stuff that I get to do, which is is great fun, you know. And and I get mm -hmm. to branch out a little bit. Um, but I, I think you know the enameling is the, what intrigues me a lot at the moment, and I really want to start incorporating a bit more um, epoxy clays and things in there too, mm -hmm. uh, and some of the stuff that you can do with that. So it is just a never-ending fun zone with polymer because <laughs> it's so friendly. You can start jamming mm -hmm. all kinds of things in it. But I'm, I'm kind of looking back. When I first started polymer, I did studio work, um, and I didn't do anything with uh, smaller beads or anything else. Mm -hmm. That that came kind of later, um, and and all my stuff were bigger pieces. So one of the things I'm kind of experimenting a bit with right now, and I haven't unveiled any of it yet, but I'm playing with it, um, is using um, mostly ultralight uh, mm -hmm. to create pieces that are then attached to canvas or wood and then the whole piece is painted so it's a dimensional painting. Okay. So I'm playing with that um, but that's again polymer to help me make things pop out. So yeah, yeah. I love all of them but uh, but that I think metal clays are, and, and especially enamels intrigue me because that, that's sort of the next thing I might dabble with when I get a chance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so can you discuss if you ever felt um, pigeonholed or limited by being a, a polymer clay artist because a lot of people will say well you need to focus or you know yep. that kind of feeling sometimes yeah. pervades the artists um, you know it's it's funny know. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you're saying, and, and the world of art is a, is an odd one, because there's like this this continuum, and you have on the one hand the dabblers, people who are absolutely content and rightly so, to you know be able to make a project whenever they want, share their polymer with their friends, their kids, their grandkids, and they just enjoy the joy of making stuff, and they don't really care what somebody thinks about their medium or what they're doing with it, because they're having fun, they're mm -hmm. making fun things, and occasionally I think they're made to feel inadequate by somebody going well. Do do you sell your work? Well, do you? Do, do, do. And it's like to which I say, um, let them play. It's all good. Uh, nobody has to sell their work if they don't want to. There's no need to do that to prove yourself. Enjoy yourself. But then once you get into that world of trying to become professional, there is quite a broad spectrum. And I know sometimes I'm looked at because I have a product line and because I do a lot of how-to books and I do a lot of teaching that I'm kind of put in that category of like that's what I do. I do cute little animals and I do you know like dragons and stuff. And yes, I do. That's a large part of what I do. 
but then I have you know I have another more serious side that I like to play with too and sometimes I've run into some of my fellow polymer friends uh, one thing that will be I don't know who this person is and it's not a polymer person and I don't mean to make fun of anybody but it was so hilarious I was at a recent conference and there was a mixture of polymer people and people from the outside art world that were in there too museum curators people that were at a serious level of art which of course is the discussion you know where does polymer fit as a serious art medium and there we were watching something and there was a couple of people up on the um, the screen part of a film presentation and I forget there was somebody up there that was a name um, and they had a similar look you know blonde hair whatever else and so this we were all kind of chatting to our neighbors afterwards and the neighbor was talking to me and she was a museum curator or something like that and so she said so are you so and so whoever it was like honestly I can't remember right now and I went oh no I'm Christy Friesen and it's just like that light switched off like I wasn't who she expected I wasn't a serious artist but bye and she just basically went uh huh and then left mm -hmm. and I just went cracked off because I thought you have no idea you haven't talked to me you don't know my body of work you have no idea who I I am, but you just decided that since I'm not whoever it is you thought I was, then then forget it. Um, and by the way, the phone ringing, that's not for me, so don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm in my, my studio where my husband's business is as well, and, and he's scampered off somewhere, so anyway. Uh, but you know, that is kind of sort of puts in a nutshell where artistic discussion can sometimes come between the people who play and goof around and to the people who are creating, you know, a body of work that's taken more seriously. And I feel like I'm kind of, I float, I'm a little fluid in all those areas, and I'm mm -hmm. totally fine with that. Um, I think the reason polymer sometimes gets a bad name, and that's changed now, um, mm -hmm. due to the work of Elise Winters and some of the others that have been very instrumental in just pushing what polymer does into the face of the people who are fine arts. Um, so that 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 has changed the climate somewhat. And uh, forgive me for the noise in the background; that'll go away in a minute. <laughs> okay. um, the answer machine's on. Hubby's not around. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so uh, I think that it depends on what people do with it. I mean, if you have Picasso and he takes chewing gum and string and makes something, nobody's going to mind that it was chewing gum and string because it's like, Picasso, look at how innovative he is using these odd materials. And that's kind of, I think, where polymer falls. When someone does a beautiful job, the fact that it's made out of polymer is an incidental that you read on the card afterwards when you read what the media is and it doesn't matter mm -hmm. but if you lead with that it's like oh I'm polymer clay you know well then sometimes people automatically have a reaction so usually when I'm approaching some myself personally when I'm approaching something more prestigious I um, either will be a mixed media artist or I'll do embellished polymer with mixed media elements I'll name it something a bit more sophisticated mm -hmm. so that it helps break a barrier of preconceived expectations in the right. person viewing it and that's what I think you have to do um, so there's nothing you know embarrassing about being a polymer clay artist but I kind of consider myself an artist whose medium happens to be primarily polymer mm -hmm. and you know that's how I've always looked at myself and I think those who are making a name for themselves in um, the art community have done the same thing that they you know they consider themselves an artist whose primary medium is polymer so I don't really think that there's a bad connotation it just depends on where you are and where you know if you're at a little church bizarre and you're doing polymer clay then that's great no problem if you're stepping up your game you better make sure it fits the venue you're in so mm -hmm. you know I think it's a, such a new material and it is so easy mm -hmm. that it has often been looked down on but you know so is acrylic paint you know people can do horrendous things with acrylic paint <laughs> and that hasn't made you know acrylic paint be like a no-no in the art community it just right. depends on what you're doing with it so yeah I think we're we're past that we're moving in um, but those of you who are considering entering any kind of shows or contests or things like that, please do remember to name it something like that. Do polymer with mixed media or whatever, something like that, uh, and that helps a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like we um, we usually lead with art jewelry, you know. Yes. When, when we're yes, absolutely talking about like for example the things that were in our book. So yes, yeah, like yes. leading with what it is rather than yeah, it's the out of this clay that you might think is plastic. You know? Yeah, yeah, so. exactly, and, and yeah, and yeah. I think it all is a matter of how you feel about your work. If you're mm -hmm. feeling somewhat embarrassed, then that's <laughs> going to come out in your presentation. But if you're like, "Hey, look at me, this is what I'm doing," mm -hmm. you know, then it's going to come out that way too. And I just think it's to me, polymer is one of the best kept secrets in the fine arts. Mm -hmm. That if many of the people who work in fine arts realized how versatile, how sophisticated, and how absolutely wonderful 
hand feel polymer has, mm -hmm. there would be a lot more of them using it because it's it's brilliant stuff. It's and you can do stuff with polymer you can't do with anything else, yeah. and it is very you know long lasting too if if, if baked properly and all that. So yeah, I, I I can see it becoming more and more um, a fine arts popular you know as time goes on. Yeah, but yeah, we'll, yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about that more in question seven because yeah, I yeah. want to talk about some of the ways that we can use it that you have, um, beautiful, you know, that you're yeah. talking about in in flourish and some other stuff. So, Yay. so let's see. Our next question is: What's the first art project you can remember, and why do you think it's relevantly stuck in your memory? Is it the well, four-year-old oil painting? Yeah. <laughs> That four-year-old oil painting, obviously, I've kept that memory forever, and I don't know if it was so much the the turpentine baths afterwards, <laughs> or just being able to, you know, create something, you know, at that early of an age to see color go on and the blends of color, which of course mm. is what appeals to me in polymer too, is that you take all these colors and the mixtures that they do give you just this range of delightful color blending, all that stuff that really. It, that that still thrills me. I just get excited about mixing clay. It's just such fun. And I just got back from teaching on uh, Pavelka, Lisa Pavelka's Polymer Paradise Cruise mm -hmm. to the Caribbean. Woohoo! <laughs> but one of the things we did, you know, we were doing ocean life. So a large amount of what we were doing early on in the beginning of the class was mixing ocean blends mm -hmm. so that then your creatures and things could live on that. And just watching people have, and nobody's blends were the same. Mm -hmm. Everything was a different look and the way the watery stuff goes, that still excites me. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, th those kind of early memories are, are strong. And I, I have a couple of other memories too because you know I've always obviously I've always had a talent for art um, which many folks do they find early on that that's something that they do well and then people are excited about that they want to see would you make me this could I buy that and those are always exciting memories when when somebody's gone out of their way to see something that you've made and go I, I need to have that can I give you some money and then as a kid it's like ding 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 <laughs> hey this is a whole lot better than working at McDonald's or whatever mm -hmm. so I, I can remember being in high school and uh, we had a very good arts program and I, I I'm very sad for our modern kids that do not have the same art program that we had in, in the day um, but we had a really good art program and I remember doing a bunch of painting in that class and, and people you know parents as people's parents would come and can I buy that one and that was very exciting you know to have made something and you know I went through my National Geographic and I'd find pictures from National Geographic and paint you know a lot of things from there and I remember um, again this is probably early junior high time frame I decided that um, uh, that that our uh, recreational room was boring and I tried to convince my parents you know that they should allow me to paint this giant mural on the wall of, of <laughs> mountain goats you know and somehow or another I convinced them because they that wasn't really their they were very artistic but that was a whole wall and how would that the value of the house that was, but uh, we I remember painting a whole wall mountain and you know doing all these different uh, bighorn sheep or whatever it was and I, I remember being very excited about that by taking a large canvas and changing the world into something else in my little mm -hmm. world. So all of those memories of people liking what I did, and and then when when the claying cut, uh, came around, when I started sculpting, uh, you know that one just hit a nerve with people. I, they everybody wanted everything I made, and that's been very similar to my polymer experience. I I went back and I found a little box that somebody had squirreled away from my family with early pieces of mine that I did out of ceramic clay, mm -hmm. and th a lot of the same kind of ideas same goofy characters and the same kind of way that I do it and looking back and going yeah I really haven't changed that much you know you kinda I kinda had my style set way back in the day but it was nice to remember you know how much people were like when's the new kill mode coming out when can we see what you made <laughs> you know and that's that's a very exciting thing when you get a lot of of feedback mm -hmm. early on you know it helps you create better and I think that's one thing that that's what Facebook does now um, because you can put your pieces up and have your fan, your friends, uh, fans if you have them, but at least your co uh, co artists to go. Wow, I really like how you did that thing, and that's I think one of the benefits of what you're doing. And I I think um, uh, there's another one out there. It's called the Friesen Project, but uh, mm -hmm. Katie uh, mm -hmm. is is doing that uh, on Facebook, where they're going through the books and people are posting the things that they've made. And of course, it's very flattering to me because it, I'm seeing my projects interpreted through other people's eyes, and that's thrilling beyond belief. I mean, I 
just think that's the coolest thing ever. But it's a really valuable thing when you do something like this, when you go through a book and you let people you you add your own input, like you'll be putting up your own projects that are spin offs mm -hmm. of that, and other people will be posting their ideas, things that they've made. To me that is so great because people get to see each other's work, they can comment, and that's what you need. You need somebody to go, Wow, you did a really great job with that leaf. How did you do that? I, I love how you put the pearls in there. That's so great. We need that. Artist being an artist is completely ego driven. And it should be. <laughs> and that's why some people turn into divas because it's such an ego intense thing. You are pulling from your outsides and you are displaying that to the world. And when the world comes back and says, wow, that's great, that just feeds that, builds that up. So that part of it is good. The more you get that back, the better you can become. It's just always reminding yourself, yeah, you're not all that. Just relax. <laughs> don't get your head, you know, whatever. Uh, you know, that's what sometimes people don't forget. Mm -hmm. Or they forget to, to keep it, you know, keep it a little bit more real. But uh, it is very good for us to get that feedback back and forth. So, you know, my, a lot of my early remembrance. Now, I might have had some where people said, that's crap. What are you doing? <laughs> I've conveniently forgotten those. But I've remembered all the ones where people were like, wow, that's terrific. I want it. Would you make me one? How, you know, those kind of things. And it kind of helps you move forward. Mm -hmm. At least I think so. I've, I've been very lucky to have gotten a lot of feedback and very early on I had people who wanted to make what I was making and I had my brain set thankfully to know that that was a good thing that was flattery not everybody handles that the same way and I'm not judging anybody who doesn't like that for mm -hmm. me I like it I feel that it's a positive thing we're all creating together it keeps me on my toes makes me make sure that I'm making new stuff that I'm getting better that I keep moving forward not make the same thing over and over again um, but can appreciate you know the classic stuff you know every time I see a dragon I'm happy because you know somebody's <laughs> taken that little book and and made another dragon and I make them too you know they're just great fun mm -hmm. so so yeah it's all good it's all good <laughs> Cool. Well, so now let's get to um, when you were talking before about moving polymer into sort of the fine art and mixed media spectrum. Yeah. So yep. um, there are lots of different tools and supplies that you reference in yes. your book. Yes. And yes. some of them, which you have developed yourself, yes. um, like Swelligant and the three um, metal tools that, yeah. you know, like yeah. the Can't Live Without It tool. And yeah. Oh, I happen to have them right here. <laughs> How convenient. I thought we might chat about those. I think you can kind of see them here. But, uh, yeah, they're, they're wonderful. And if I can just jump right in, you mind? Mm -hmm, sure. Uh, these ones came about, I love them. And obviously, I was a ceramic, uh, earth and clay uh, creator long before. And some of these, anybody who's worked with earth and clays will see that there's some Kemper tool elements mm -hmm. to these. So I've had favorites in my repertoire, but it'd be like, I like this side, but not that side. And I only wish this one was fatter. And what if the, you know, and in polymer clay, wood is a problem because it starts building up the, mm -hmm. the oils and stuff from the clays. So after a while, it really starts to drag. It's not an insurmountable problem, mm -hmm. but both polymer, I mean, sorry, plastics and woods kind of drag on the clay, but stainless steel does not. I mean, it just presses where it needs to go and it pushes it and it feels good. The weight's right. So I um, was teaching in New York City. A friend of mine owns a huge sculptor store in Manhattan, and he had me come up there for uh, a book release party and we did some I did some uh, teaching classes and he said you know we manufacture tools if you ever have a tool that you think our people all our sculptor people would like and I go I have two of them and he goes, okay let's take a look so we kind of prototyped them out and and I you know I like this but we need to make this fat da, da, da. so he got them made and you know we partnered together on that and I absolutely just love them and I was like I hope other people like these too because we made a freaking lot of them and, <laughs> and then we met we brought in the third one and people have just really enjoyed working with these tools and it, it, they're just they're just so nice so anybody who hasn't played with them before. Uh, if you have another polymer friend who has borrowed theirs, if you come to my classes, I always let you use them. And pretty much 75 to 85 percent of the people walk out buying them before they mm -hmm. leave just because they're so great. I mean, they're not cheap. They're like 15 bucks a piece, but they are wonderful. And, you know, I have not yet met a polymer person who wasn't a sort of a closet tool junkie um, <laughs> and maybe not even so closet. Uh, we just like tools and these are, are fabulous. So I developed them for me with the hopes that other people would like them which is kind of how a lot of my product line has started. Um, it wasn't on purpose. I didn't like, oh, I think I'll be the king of merchandising. Mm -hmm. It would just be like I'd find something and I'm like, wow, I really like this. And then I'd use it. And people go, "How did? what is that thing that you got? I go, oh, it's this thing. Do you have any more? No, I don't. So mm -hmm. then I started realizing when I saw something that I liked, I'd buy a lot of them. 
Number one, I got them cheaper, which was great, and then I could repackage them and sell them because I knew people would go, well, I love how you made that gear in there. Can I have some gears? Well, yes, you can. So a lot of the things that I did, did that. And then the Swelligan stuff, and I'll just hold it up for anybody who's not seen that, and obviously you can go on my website and find it, but it's five different metals, three different patinas, and like 11 different dyes. Then there's a prep material and a, um, a sealer. And I won't go into all the blather about it, but uh, the, the story is kind of fun. Is um, again, when I was with my friend who was, um, that must be a plane in your area. Or in oh, my head. Do you hear yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <Yeah. laughs> um, my friend up in uh, the New York guy, I was in, and he has everything in the universe that you could ever do with any sculpture of any kind. And I got some of these metal coating stuff. And I, they sat in my studio for like a year or two. And I finally thought, I, mean, I got to play with that. And I started playing with it. And I thought, oh my God, this is amazing. So I talked to the company and I'm like, man, I need to have these things. I want to teach this in class. And they said, well, we only make them in big bottles. And I said, yeah, but could you make them in small? And they said, no, because mm -hmm. our people are too expensive. You don't, you know, you couldn't afford it. But you could buy it. We'll help you. We'll work with you. You could buy it in bulk and repackage it. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I don't want to pour a bunch of stuff in another little bottle. That seems horrible. So I thought about it for like three days. And I thought, oh, I got to do that because this is so great. And everybody's going to love it. So we did. And we launched this whole thing. And they carry a ton of products. But I worked with them to kind of fine tune stuff that's non-toxic, non-hazardous, low or no odor, mm -hmm. and is really easy to use in the studio, soap and water wash up, all that kind of stuff that we want. Because um, they do a lot of things for the industrial and professional artists, so there's a lot of smell and protective mm -hmm. gear involved, and you know, so this line doesn't have that. But what it is, it's, it's a pulverized metal in a, in a clear base. So you can paint on metal onto your polymer pieces, so it allows you to work with metal without a kiln, without a torch, without all those things, because you're you're adding your metal to the top. So that opened up all kinds of stuff, because I was already playing with steampunk, as you well know, and I love steampunk, and having the idea of using your metal clays, your bronzes and bra uh, coppers and all those metal clays, which are exciting, but knowing that that's another step for most people, including myself, you got to get a kiln, you got to learn how to do it, and it takes different time. Not to put that down, I think that's fascinating, but for many of us, we want the look of metal, but we don't want we can't or we won't go to all that effort so being able to use these is terrific because it's real metal it really oxidizes as it should you know and then the dyes help it color and people are doing some amazing stuff with this this I mean obviously it's made for other things besides just polymer but being a polymer artist, that's how I'm using it. But uh, I've got a little uh, Facebook page. It's just Swelligant. It's an open group. And you can just go stroll around in there and see what people are up to. They've added tutorials and they've got links to their site. They put their formulas. I did this and this and it made this and look at that. And there's just like, you know, fabulous stuff people are doing with that. So if you're interested in that and all, there's a free, uh, any of the listeners, there's a free download on my website. Just go to the swell again thing. At the moment, it's in English and German. I'm working on getting it in some of the other languages, but that's where I am so far. Um, but it's a free kind of overview of how to. And if you go over to craftcast.com, there is a uh, – we did a recent I Love Tools uh, live thing, and they I think that will be available pretty soon that you can just download. It's a freebie, and I kind of did a little Swelligan, um overview. So there's some of that stuff. So I think just in the polymer in general, one of the things that I like is that as you come across stuff that involves your medium, in which case it's polymer, and brings it to new places, mm -hmm. then experiment with it. So obviously I use these coatings. I use acrylic paint. I use all the other coatings that are out there. I use glitters and powders. I'm putting beads in them. I'm adding metal to them. I'm feathers and fibers and felting. You know, anything that can be combined with polymer to make your end product more interesting. Mm -hmm. That's what you got to do. So that's what I'm all about. Anything I find, I want to share with people because they're here and there and you got to buy them in bulk a lot of times. So if I can bring them in and, and make it more available like um gold and silver leaf. I love the real stuff. Nothing mm -hmm. looks like real gold and silver. Nothing. I mean, I love my Swelligant metal coatings, um, but nothing looks like the real deal. So I buy it in bulk and I repackage it in, you know, two leaves at a time so it's affordable. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to buy your 70 or $100 package, you know, or whatever. You can get it in, in smaller. Uh, just use the leaf. So I'm going to share that anytime I get a chance on my on my uh, Yahoo store on my website. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um. So take us back to how you became interested in polymer clay sculpting specifically. Like, is there a moment? Did somebody introduce yes. you to it? Yeah, actually, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I Originally, as you know, I, I played with the 
regular earthen clay and then mm -hmm. I went on from there to do other things and I was out of clay for a long time and this was part of my sort of uh, midlife crisis in my 30s <laughs> where I just like I gotta be a real artist I gotta do something so I, I tried a lot of stuff and mm -hmm. then it was quite a long journey of try this and that didn't work and this and this nah, and then and one of the things that I was um, doing is I was being I was in a gallery and I thought well there's an awful lot of competition for wall space Mm -hmm. But there's quite a bit of um, open space on the studio floor. Mm -hmm. So if I had more sculptural items, they would get a little bit more visibility. So I thought, well, you know, I always used to do kiln-fired stuff. We had a few ceramicists that threw pots and stuff in the, the, uh, the gallery that I was a part of. So what if I went back to doing that? So I started researching, you know, okay, what kiln do I need? And what do I got to get now? What my electricity? So I was in the middle of all that. And then, um, like I mentioned to you, Karen Lewis lives up here, and she had just opened up her gallery, and, and we were neighbors. And she said, Chris, you got to come on over and see the beads and things I got. Oh, okay, yeah, no, no problem. So I went over there, and I'm looking at everything. I was like, well, what is this, Karen? She goes, well, that's polymer clay. I was like, well, what the heck is that? And so she had a pile of polymer and a bunch of books. So I, you know, bought a handful of polymer clay, and I bought, bought a book, uh, Barbara McGuire's Foundations in Polymer Clay, which it was a great book, and I brought those home, and brought the clay home, started going through that book, and reading, and making, and doing, and it was just like, oh, forget the kiln, this is <laughs> fantastic, and I, I just, I just kind of played with it, and taught myself, and goofed around, and tried to figure things out, and, you know, ask questions, and just, you know, came up with uh, my own look. It took me a while, my first stuff for six or eight months was just horrendous. I mean, just horrendous. But you got to play. You got to have all that fun before you start settling in your groove. And it was just like, no, from then on out, didn't look back. It was just, that was great. And one of the first pieces that I made, hold on one second, if you would. Sorry about that. I was just trying to get Scott not to turn on the answering machine and have you guys have to listen to that the second time. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, where was I? What was I talking about? Oh, the gallery thing. Yeah. One of the very first things I did then for the galleries, I took a really large glass vessel. It was a really nice piece of uh, ginger jar shaped thing, just tall enough that would fit in my oven. I mean, it was big. <laughs> and I covered all of it with clay, and there was like all of these turtles crawling all over it with jeweled backs. Mm -hmm. And I put that in the gallery, and it sold like the first day. I'm like, mm -hmm. Ooh, I'm onto something here. This is good. So most of the stuff that I did from then on out, and not that I sold all of them, but it was a nice success early on. Um, all of the sculptural pieces did real well, and then later on, I I wandered off into the bead world, which is where I've been often uh, mm -hmm. in the bead and, and uh, jewelry world since then. But uh, it's been it's been a fun journey, and it was accidental. So I appreciate that. <laughs> I just ha stumbled across somebody who was creating with polymer and I think many of the our fellow viewers here that are in polymer that's how they came across it mm -hmm. somebody was doing it somewhere and they're like what is that and you know and then oh let me show you or they stumbled into Michaels while someone was doing a demo that kind yeah. of thing. But yeah, yeah I it's, had a it's, very similar um, yeah. experience because I was a ceramic artist also oh okay cool. and I wanted I to make it a gift for somebody I was young and I lived in an apartment and I couldn't get a kiln so somehow somebody turned me on to polymer and that's, right. that's what happened, you know. I know, and then because you never look back. Cause it's, yeah. yeah. It's a very fun medium. It's 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 to me it's an immediate gratification mm -hmm. medium. Is like the color is the color. The shape yep. is the shape. It doesn't shrink, it doesn't blow up in the kiln, it doesn't <laughs> magically become it's just what you put in, that's what you get. And it's yep. just so satisfying. I mm -hmm. love that. Yeah. yeah. It's good yeah, stuff. It is. So let's talk a little bit about how you set up your books. So you have awesome guidelines oh. and troubleshooting, um, the back of the book type stuff. Um, so if you, you know, if anybody gets any of her books, this, that's what you're going to see in the back. Is the guidelines, <laughs> troubleshooting type areas, yeah. and this thing called the back of the book where there's a lot of resources. Yes. Um, so can you take us beyond that? Like what? Um, Tips or tricks yeah. do you do you maybe have that you didn't write in there? <laughs> oh wow, yeah. I mean, that could be a whole book on itself, couldn't it? With <laughs> yeah. just so many little things. One thing that I've always wanted to do is I wanted to do like a, a, a like an oops book, mm. you know, where it's like what could go wrong, how to fix it. You mm -hmm. know, like when things burn, what do you do? Yeah. When things break, what do you do? You know, and there's a lot of that. And then maybe one of these days I'll do that as just some downloadable material, but. Um, one of the things I think that I want to tell people is don't be scared mm 
mm. you know, with what you're doing. There's very little technical must knows in polymer, and they all kind of center around baking. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> if you get the baking right, everything else is just fun time. Uh, but I remember one time we were, in, I was in a class, and that this is kind of going with the don't be scared thing is like, you know how you're feeling about your your piece, and if something's not working, stop and figure out what that is. Don't get mad and throw it against the wall, which some people do. <laughs> but just like stop for a minute and try to analyze it. You know, go away and come back if you need to. But I remember we were in a class, and and they, it was like a three or four day class, and we were making four legged creatures. And there's two stories from that class that are fun. The first is that as we were making our base, you know, I had them get a rock which this is a trick I use all the time, is I, I you want something heavy to weigh down a larger sculpture. So I oftentimes will get a rock and I'll use plumber's uh, epoxy. And you can get it at any hardware store. It's like a little tube and it's it's basically epoxy, uh, like you would get epoxy clay, but it hardens in about 5-10 minutes. So it's very fast acting, very strong. And I'll use that to wire down um, wires directly onto the rock. So then those are the armature bases that I can put trees or animals on and they go right on the rock. Then I wrap the rock in foil because the foil grabs the rock and then clay grabs the foil. If you just put clay on top of the rock, that works, but there's a lot of flopping around. But the foil will grab the rock, the clay will grab the foil. So a lot of times I'll have these wires sticking out that I've used the plumber's epoxy with and the wires make the clay grab on and then the foil wraps around. So we had had the base and everybody was making their little mount, I mean their little hillocks and, and um, mounds of grass and all that stuff. And she goes, you know, I don't want to make a four-legged creature. I said, okay, what do you want to make? She goes, I really all of a sudden feel like I want to make like this tree with all these dangling leafy vines and stuff. I said, well, do that. So that's the first thing I would tell everybody is that if you thought you were going to do something but something else happens, go with the something else. Because that creative thing is taking you somewhere. Follow, always follow the rabbit hole. So do that. And then the second thing in that same class is we were all coming along. Everybody had made their armatures. We have our four-legged beasts there. And then I, you know, I'm I'm always listening for happy sounds or sad sounds because I want to know where people are. And I heard this little sighing going on. And I'm I, so I trot over there. So like, how's it going? What's happening? And she goes, Well, it's okay. I said, No, it's really happening. She goes, Well, she was making like an antelope or something. She goes, It's it's kind of like a wiener dog. It's a little longer than I thought, but that's okay. I said, okay, wait a minute. You've got two more days of playing with this guy. Now, if you are unhappy right now, then I don't care how many flourishes and embellishments you put on it. Every time you look at it, you're going to see wiener dog, right? She's like, yeah, kind of. I said, okay, we can fix this. So what we did is we, we sliced through the clay because she had done all the armature. It was covered. The whole skin was on. All the clay was on. So it was a lot of work in there. I said, watch this. And so we peeled, we kind of cut and peeled back his skin, and we cut through the foil, and then we used, you know, clippers or whatever else it is to cut the wire. And we took out like a two-inch chunk from his middle, put it back together, duct tape it up, and put all the clay back on. Because duct tape can go in the oven, no problem. It doesn't mind if it's under the clay. Nothing happens. And so now it was a little shorter. And yes, she was a little more you know, stretch legged than before, but not much. Um, we would have moved the legs if it was awkward. I said, now what do you think? She goes, this is so much better. And that's one of the back of the book things I would tell everybody is, it does not matter how much fancy stuff you put on something. If the bones are wrong, it's going to look like crap. Yeah. So take the time to make the design right. Take the time to make your armature, whatever it is you're doing, make it proportionate. You know, if the eyeballs are all crazy and the mouth is droopy, it can have the loveliest hair in the world, but still going to look like a stroke victim. So you want to make sure you take the time to make everything flow like it should. And that was not to put down anybody who is uh, having issues in that way, but it's a good visual for people. I'll Salvador Dali. They'll look like a Salvador Dali painting with melting things. So you want to really take your time to make sure that the all of those boring parts are done right, that things are where they ought to be. Because I've seen people that are embellishment, they embellish beautifully, but underneath there's awkwardness. So take a little time on that, you know, get mm -hmm. some other eyeballs in there. Another great back of the book thing that's not in the back of the book is you turn things upside down. Because when you're making something, your eye is is going to see what it should be. If you're making a butterfly, you've got butterfly imprinted, a butterfly, uh, the brain goes, oh yeah, butterfly, just, just see a butterfly, no problem. But when you turn it upside down, you have a few seconds of shape only. It has not yet registered as butterfly. So you can go, oh my goodness, that wing is way huger than that one, and why is that one at that angle? You see that when you turn it upside down. So do that a lot, you know, get stand over your pieces, turn them upside down, do whatever you need to do early on to see if the proportions are good, if it flows right before you start embellishing everything. That's kind of a couple little tips that I would say are, are like spot on there for, for anybody who wants to get better at what they do. Yeah, good 
advice because Thank you're you. so right about the bones. Because, yeah. Yeah. You know, that's and there's that many <laughs> many euphemisms for that, you know, like Yeah. Yeah. Some people say putting lipstick on a pig or, you know, like. Yes, those. exactly yeah. right. Yeah. 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 And I think we polymer folk are very adept at embellishing. I mean, we'll put decorations on until you force us out of the room. But a lot of us want to jump to that part. And me, <laughs> myself included, I want the fun stuff. But you really got to take your time at the beginning and make sure it's working. Yeah. You know, before all that fun stuff happens. So yep. that that that's my advice for today. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, so, Christy, a lot of our audience um, are mixed media or general crafters. So, you know, can you tell us a little bit about how they might be able to utilize a book like yes. Flourish? Yes. Um, to expand their repertoire if they're not coming to us as a polymer clay part of our audience? Oh, absolutely. In fact, I'm glad you say that because that's one of the areas that I would really like to concentrate in this coming, you know, this next year for myself is kind of reaching out to a lot of the crafting community as well as the fine arts community. So those are two areas that I want to move beyond just our polymer gang, which we all know each other, we love each other, we're all watching what each other are doing. Now let's expand it out there. But I really do think polymer is one of those things that many other media haven't found yet. And ought to. Obviously, the doll makers have found that. And polymer has been used for doll making for ages. And anybody who's into puppetry or articulated dolls. Um, one of the tricks that I like to do is I like to use, and this is in, it's in Flourish, but it's in more detail in my Woodland Creatures book, is there is a uh, type of polymer clay um, that's called ultralight. Uh, Primo, or the Sculpey people make it. And ultralight is a real marshmallowy goo, but it carves like you wouldn't believe. It's like soap carving. So I do a lot of articulated dolls. So anybody in the doll making community, you may want to pick up the Woodland Creatures book as a little how-to. And there is a there is a nod to that in Flourish as well. I have a carved section in Flourish. And you make things out of the ultralight carve it with just an exacto knife and then you can articulate it by having holes through and putting wires in so that joints move so anybody in the doll making field if you haven't played with polymer for facial features and, and hands obviously go there um, anybody who has not yet in the polymer world added uh, fibers for hair and other things that the doll maker people know. You might want to crisscross and look into the doll maker universe to add to your polymer knowledge. Um, I think a lot of the people in the fiber arts, both weaving and so uh, sewing, especially like quilting and appliques and things, there's a lot of crossover in the polymer book, uh, in the polymer world, and especially in the flourish book where there's a lot of flowers. I know a lot of quilters, um, floral themes are very popular. You can make ultra thin polymer and put holes in it which then can be sewn directly onto an art quilt. So if you wanted to have an art quilt where all of your leaves and stems are all appliqued with your fabric but then your flowers are polymer so they can be dimensional. They can put holes right in the head of the flower so it directly onto your fabric. And because you can make it very, very thin, uh, it is, is lightweight. Or you can add beetles or bugs or whatever directly onto uh, fiber. Or uh, let's say you're making an ocean scene and then you can have fish swimming around or that kind of thing. So there's a lot of ways of adding a dimensional element to an art, a uh, fabric art piece that are really good there. Um, uh, paper arts. You can add papers, especially handmade fiber papers, to polymer. They bake in the oven with no problem. So you can incorporate your paper arts into polymer and vice versa. Uh, I also tell people who work in glass or ceramic, you often will have a piece that chips or breaks. The piece is gorgeous, but there's a freaking air bubble in the wrong place or that little handle broke off. That's where polymer is gorgeous because you can use a product like Lisa Pavelka's Polybonder glue, which is a, um, a, a super glue, but that can go in and out of the oven. So let's say you've got a pot, handle broke off. Now you create a whole bonsai tree just growing out of that area and you use that glue to attach that clay on and then you build up from there. And then you may still need to, you know, add epoxy or something like that afterwards if you want a stronger bond, but I found that usually is just fine. But now you've got a piece that you've salvaged as a ceramic artist or a glass artist by adding a polymer element to it that makes it look like you meant that all along. All the people in the metal arts, um, polymer clay can be used as a veneer. It can be inserted into the holes of something like you would in enamel. Now you're using your polymers in there, which many of them know, and or you can press it in from the backside, or you can attach it on. It rivets, so you can create all kinds of polymer veneer 
veneers with hole punches in them that then can be cold connect riveted onto your metal pieces. So you've, I mean, there's just a range of stuff that all of the people in these other fields can really come right back to and add. You can use them as toppers for if you're into any of your um, like cakes and fondants and things like that. You can use polymer to add sculpted elements to those pieces as well. So it's really, I mean, freaking versatile. It. Whatever you're doing out there, if you haven't found polymer, get your butt over here because it's great. <laughs> That's so true. That's why we love it. We yeah. do. We love it. Needless to say, anybody in the jewelry arts, if you haven't, mm -hmm. if you haven't added polymer pieces, you don't know what you're missing. <laughs> True. <laughs> so, Christy, if you could be any animal or plant, <laughs> now this is any the, fun, or the fun stuff. What would you? The fun be? stuff. <laughs> I was thinking about that, and there's like a lot of things that would be fun, but obviously for me, I'm something under the water or something up in the air because that whole just flying stuff I mean that thrills me so um any kind of bird would be freaking great um, <laughs> I, I would like that <clears throat> but I think I want to be shapeshifter so I can just change one to the other because then when I was bored of being like soaring through the sky just like dive in the water and boom turn into <clears throat> some kind of a, a sea creature and like so, be a whale can you imagine uh, being way under the water and making all that noise oh that'd be fun <laughs> You want to be a flying fish. <laughs> Actually, yeah, and I've heard those things really go crazy. My kids saw one um Hawaii or something, and they said that thing was like just zooming. Not much, just like whoop, whoop. It wasn't that. It was just like taking off or like feet. I mean, feet, 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 feet. So, yeah, that would wow. be fun. i go for that. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so, last question before we do have a few questions from the audience. Okay. But um, so, you know, you're – a very prolific author, to say the least. We have lots and lots of books, you know, filling our bookshelves from you. And you travel the world teaching. You were just on a cruise, and you live in beautiful California. You have a family. Can yes. you tell us what you do to balance so that you don't go nuts? You know, sometimes I do go nuts, <laughs> which I think all of us can relate to that. You know, you get so much, no matter how good things are, you're just human, and you have to sleep sometimes, so that catches up with you. But I've been really lucky in many ways, and I, I am very well aware that my life is, is what many people would want. And I, uh, that's one reason why I feel so compelled to share what I do and what I know. I put pictures up on Facebook of where I am. I just want to kind of take you along with me because I, I know I'm living a lifestyle that many people would like to live. Um, but I'm very lucky in that I've got a real supportive family and not everybody has that and sometimes you come home you know with your piece that you so proudly made and you show it off to your family and they're like yeah what's that supposed to be and I feel for people that have that because many people do and I would encourage you then is don't let that be your primary primary um, support group if you've got a non um, supportive or non artistic appreciative partner or family don't show them your crap. Show other people that love what you do. Show them your crap so that we can all like enjoy each other's stuff. But I'm lucky in that my kids are both artists, and my son is just recently married to someone who's an artist. And anybody who gets my eBlather, which is my little free monthly plus newsletter, and you go right on my website and click on that and get it. You'll know Michelle is in there. She's my new daughter-in-law. She's fabulous, and she's very artistic. And my son, who's a cartoonist and novelist, he's great. And my daughter does other artistic stuff. So we're like all happy family. And then my hubby is not an artistic dude, but he's real supportive. So he's our proofreader. And you know, anytime we need something with with eyeballs to see if things are straight or spelled correctly, he's the dude. But he's been real, real great about me running off all the time because that's not fun to be the one left behind while somebody's like hi honey I'm in the Caribbean having a great time you know that's never very good so he's uh, he, he's been cool about letting me run off and do that without fussing and, and being cranky about it but one of the things that's helped us and we've just kind of discovered this in the last couple of years is that I've been trying to go out of my way lately to like when I come home we'll have some time together you know he'll meet me at the airport or wherever we'll have a day just at the hotel away from home just to enjoy each other's company before we get back to our routine or I'll make sure I plan a trip that either he comes which is not often because when I go off to teach I'm on for everybody else which means that there's not a lot of me left over for family so then we'll go take other trips he and I will go off to we have a couple favorite spots and we'll just go and spend time together and, and that's important because you know the people that you love have to know that they're as important to you as the thing that you do for a living and I haven't always done that well and the last few years I've we've learned that and my kids I take them they're much more 
um, flexible because they got their own life. They're young to they do things, and they're not connected to me in that sense. Um, but I take them with me. Like my uh, all of my kids have come with me on cruises, on trips to Europe, or whatever. So that's really cool. So I try to include them as much as I can. Uh, they help me out with the stuff I do. So it is kind of a family crazy mess over here. I help my son's stuff. He helps me. My daughter's involved. So I'm very lucky in that we all have similar interests. So it's a lot easier for everybody to juggle because they've got my back and I'm bringing stuff to them that they might not normally get to do. Uh, like for example, last the spring I was in Europe and something happened to where I suddenly had like four or five days where a thing I was going to do wasn't able. We had to move it around. So I told my daughter, look, if we can get you an airline ticket, why don't you come with me? We're going to do Dublin and London. So she just got to come and we got to have fun for four days and do some stuff, which you know, that's a nifty thing. So definitely your family can give you all kinds of love and patience when you're dragging them around to fun places like that. So I really just try to remember to give them the kind of attention that I give my fans and not just give them whatever's left, which sometimes you have to think about because it's like, oh, I'm tired, leave me alone. Rah. You know, instead of like going, no, I like you guys. Let's go to the movies. Let's go out and have dinner. And so I try to have as much fun at home as I do when I'm off running around too. And that's been great. I mean, you know, more fun. Oh, okay. I guess I can do that. <laughs> Why not? But yeah, so it, it, it is good. But there is a lot of late hours. You know, I do a lot of a lot of work. I'm at this constantly. And a lot of people have asked me, you know, oh, I really wish I could, you know, do what you're doing and be like you. How do you do that? And I, a lot of times I tell them, no, you don't. Because it is on all the time. You know, there and I'm I'm fine. I like it. You know, it, it works for me. But doesn't you, I know you? You wouldn't like this because it's not just the fun that you see. It's all the other stuff. You know, the late nights and you're working on things and projects. So like a lot of times, I'll go yeah yeah on the cruise, and then I'm back in the room for two or three more hours typing afterwards. You know, and still get up. You know, in a few hours to do stuff. So there's a lot behind the scenes, but I can't complain. I, I got right. some fun stuff going on. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think the grass is always greener. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Because... Yeah. For sure, yeah. for sure, and I am aware that my grass is greener, and I'm very thankful for that. But I work it, you know, I work it hard. And most of the people you see in any that are professional artists in any kind and are making their living at it, there is a lot of work because you're wearing a marketing hat, you're wearing a salesperson hat, you're wearing your artist hat, and and you still have to wear your family hat too. And you can't. It's hard to juggle all those things, you know. And sometimes it just doesn't work. I know a lot of people they split up after a while because it just isn't working for them. That happens, you know. And that's nothing to feel embarrassed about if that's what happens in your life. People don't always stay together. I've just been lucky that we've been through some ups and downs and we're in an up, so it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> but spending time, you know, giving the time back to the people you love, that's important. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a few questions. So All one right. Let them on them is, um, what are some of the most different media that you've put into your pieces? Like, tell us about some unusual stuff that landed in polymer clay. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Um, obviously, I do steampunk stuff, so a lot of vintage and found objects, you know, so the, I, I often have um, unusual bits in there. And this one isn't so unusual, but it was an accident. And that was kind of fun, as I was early on, before I un knew that there was resin and other ways to make a clear look, I had this giant vase, and I was trying to glass vase, trying to fill it up with layers of liquid clay to create sort of like an ocean thing. I don't know what I was doing. So I kind of like, I did this first layer without first measuring to see if it fit in the oven and it didn't. It was like an inch wrong. So I thought, okay, well what if I like take all the shelves out and I like jam it in there. And so I did and then I hear this, you know, it's in the oven. I hear this ping and I go, oh, that's not good. So I look and of course the bottom is cracked off the top and liquid clay is oozing everywhere. So I try to clean up that mess. I'm like, okay, now I have two broken things. I have this big thick glass base and I have this stupid conical weirdness so I turned the conical one upside down covered it with clay and turned it into this cone of ocean that turned out great and then I took the big heavy base and I put like seaweed and junk and stuck it on top so it's like you're looking down through the ocean and put rocks all around so it wasn't and nope they both worked out fabulous two completely different things because of screwing up so that was fun um, but uh, other than that you know those weren't unusual just a little different little trick that's happened but I have used a lot of um, crazy found objects you know stupid things off the side of the road and you know odd odd stuff like that which is kind of fun I'm trying to think if there's been anything like really amazing that I've put in there that's kind of fun um, I know. I remember back when you were when you had the fish um, article that yeah. you were using raw um, gemstones, emeralds, you know, like yeah, emeralds yeah. And, yeah, things like that. Well, I, I remember that, all of that 
because they were because they're my birthstone. So I, was like, uh, I oh, love emeralds. Cool, that's cool. And I use a lot of that expensive stone. I mean, you wouldn't think about that, but I I love that. I just think it works so well with polymer. And I have a lot of pieces with emeralds and rubies and things. And I think there was one thing that I did. I, I got came across some really kind of big rubies. They're very opaque, so they're not like really expensive rubies, but they're kind of big. They were like five carat rubies or whatever, and I think I did a big horse one time with Pegasus wings, and I used the, the kind of big rubies for eyes and stuff, and that turned out really good, and then I had a bunch of rhodochrosite, um, that pink stone that I used all in the wings and everything else, so that one turned out, I thought, rather lovely, <laughs> but I do tend to use a lot of uh, a lot of those gemstones whenever I can find them, and pearls, oh yeah, yeah, like crazy. And um, I, I've used, um, in my rants around Europe and stuff, I always have my eye open for everything. So um, I've got a piece that I did uh, for a class. It was neat. It was a class in Ireland, and we did a takeoff on the Book of Kells, which is an illuminated manuscript from, I think, like the 1300s or something. And it has a lot of those Celtic creatures and stuff. So we use that as our inspiration for making a plaque. But um, in that, part of the thing was, since we were also on tour there, is that people were to gather little artifacts as they went along and incorporated them in. So on that particular one, we had little chunks of castle in it, little rocks from the ocean, and seashells that we found, little old Irish coins. So we used all these little nifty little bits of, um, like there's so many sheep over there, and they are always rubbing up against the barbed wire fences, so there's always strands of sheep wool, and we used yeah. those. <laughs> so we were incorporating like all this stuff from the Irish countryside into the piece, which was, that was a lot of fun. So that one was that was had some different things into it. Um, I think I've used some things where I had like chicken bones in there at one point. Uh, oh, raccoon fur. One morning, like one, I, I should say one night, I was just hearing. There's an, a time when the raccoons are. I don't know what they are. They're all in heat or something. But they're out there screeching and yelling and running around. And there was just like this huge noisy party of raccoons going on outside. So the next morning, there's these little clumps of raccoon fur all around. So obviously somebody had too much to drink. But I, I gathered them all up and I put them like in a little foil and I put them in the oven and baked them. So if there's any raccoon cooties, they were all gone. And then I used those little bits of fur and and wrapped them all up and stuck them in the heads of those little gooey things that I make. So that was different. <laughs> That was fun. So, raccoon man, just keep your fur. eye open. Yeah, right? I think wild raccoon fur is going to top the That's list. That's probably going to top the list. Yep, <laughs> wild raccoon fur. The morning after raccoon fur. <laughs> so, see, as an artist, hoarding is okay because it's not hoarding. You're gathering up necessary supplies. And yeah. I'll write anyone a note to that effect if they need to show their spouses. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> We have a question about wondering when you're go you're going to do a dog book. I am working on it right now as we speak. Um, I am hoping to be able to to put up the pre-order um, stuff um, in the beginning of December with it coming out in March. That's what I'm expecting. So that's what I'm hoping for. I got my fingers crossed. We should we should have that. So okay. it's it's on the works, kids. I really am working on it. I promise. <laughs> I promise. Um, there was and I'm working comment. on a couple of others too. So. Oh, of course you are. Of oh yeah, are. yeah. <laughs> there was a comment when you were talking about the vase with the resin and the water thing. What kind oh, yeah. of resins do you like to use? I have two that I like to use. Three actually. Anytime I'm using small amounts, I'm I'm using uh, Magic Gloss, which is just the best UV resin out there. Um, most of the UV resins are pretty good. I just love Magic Gloss, and most of the people that have used it would say the same that it just it works just right, and it's got a lot of properties that are great. So I use that all, all the time. Mm -hmm. But there are times when you're making a deeper, you know, you, that one you've got to do little thin layers and build it up. Sometimes you want a big deeper thing or there's overhang and the UV light can't get to all the spots that you want it to. So um, I use either, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, either ice resin or Envirotech light. And Envirotech light you can get um, just about any hardware stores often carry it, as does Michael's, and it comes in a couple different sizes. And I, that's my go-to. Um, and I, 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 then I also use ice resin too, and it comes in a couple different ways: bottles and um, plungers and stuff. And I think Nun Design also has a two-part resin, which is real nice. I've used that a lot. So those are all real good, and they are all low odor and really easy. You know, equal parts, mix it up. And here's a little trick for you that somebody told me along the way and has proved to be quite good is that and when you're doing a two-part resin, you have to mix equal parts or the resin doesn't harden. If you put just a little bit more of the hardener in, 
that will always make sure that your resin hardens well and is not gummy or sticky. So mm -hmm. put just a bit more, you know, probably like a, a less than 10%, you know, 10%, a 20th, uh, you know, just a little bit more in there, and that works. Okay. So then the question is, if, if they can pre-order this dog book, um, is that going to yes. be on your website? Uh, yes. It'll be I'm, everywhere. You will not be able to escape me. But okay. I always suggest to people that you sign up for that e-blather. It is great fun. It is. Um, there's always a, a creative tip. There's often free projects on there. I'm yammering about amusing and witty things all the time. There's pictures of stuff, and it's always telling you what's the newest, the latest, the bestest, and all that stuff. And it, it's great fun. And I, I, it comes out once a month with a occasional e blats in between if there's something amusing that I want to tell you um, and I think you'd enjoy it it's not like a big buy this buy this buy this mm -hmm. I'll let you know if there's something new that you can coincidentally buy but generally it's about creative tips and sharing whatever thing I'm thinking about that month so sign up there and you'll know immediately when the pre-order comes if mm -hmm. not you'll know it on my website it'll be on there and I'll probably Facebook about it you you'll, you'll find out but I'm <laughs> expecting in the beginning of December and um, as we did last time with the flourish book there will be an incentive for that first group of people who sign up uh, I've got something special up my sleeve so there'll be a little like reason why you want to know so that you can you can pre-order quickly so mm -hmm. you can get in on the fun stuff oh. So with Flourish, we have in the back here, it says this stuff. It says that yeah. Fauna, Aqua, and Terra are coming. Yes. So yes. what's your timetable on that? I'm hoping to have the fauna, because obviously if you've got flora, you've got to have fauna, flora being <laughs> the plants, fauna being animal life. I love animals, and um, there are a number of animals that don't necessarily fit into categories of books that I've done already, or those books are discontinued, because I do sometimes discontinue after I've run a couple of printings of a book, um, like birds and now dragons I think I'm down to this last you know couple of dozen of dragon books in stock um, I do let them run out because it's time to move on to new stuff so um, you definitely want to you know get if you something you like get it because it may not be there forever um, but there are a lot of animals that just didn't get to be in anything so they're coming <laughs> up in fauna baby and I am working on that sort of simultaneously I've got a couple things I'm working on at the same time. So if Fauna isn't out by the end of next year, it'll be shortly thereafter. So it depends on if the other book I'm working on comes out before or after that. So, But I'm working on it, so it should be soon, within cool. a year or so. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Last technical question. Um, sure. What kind of oven do you bake in? How do you um, bake? Oven. That's a pre. That's usually the question for everybody about baking, and it doesn't matter how good you are if you bake incorrectly, your piece is crap because either bits are falling off or it's burnt, mm -hmm. and so you do have to bake properly. Um, I always recommend you get the biggest oven you can. If that's your mm -hmm. home oven, fantastic. Um, if it's a tabletop oven, just get the one with the most interior capacity. Don't let the box fool you. Sometimes it's a giant box and a tiny oven. I don't know what they're doing, <laughs> but usually it's eight to twelve inches interior space. Convection ovens are good because the air blows and circulates, which eliminates hot spots often, so we're good with that. Digital are fine, but watch it. Some of them are digital in increments of 25 degrees, which mm -hmm. is not always so good if you're doing a clay that needs 265. Right. Um, so I would say make sure you ha can do it in 5 degree incre increments. I think I've got um, like a Hamilton Beach and a Black & Decker. Those are the two that I've got all the time is in addition to my home oven. Um, but I, I found them to be really good. But the key, I think, is just the bigger ovens. Don't get those little $3 yard sale toaster oven finds. This will <laughs> scorch everything. And unfortunately, I haven't had a lot of good success with the ovens that are available um, in the craft markets that are made mm -hmm. from polymer clay. They seem to have scorching problems just as bad, if not worse, than toaster ovens. So I would just say get a tabletop as big as you can. Mm -hmm. And make sure, make sure, make sure, make sure that you have a couple of oven thermometers in there mm -hmm. and you preheat because that's the one thing that everyone does wrong is that they just turn the oven on, throw their piece in and like, why did everything burn? I don't know why. <laughs> well, because the oven is spiking as it comes back to temperature, so you only have to go 20 degrees above that sweet spot and it starts burning. So mm -hmm. you want to preheat your oven so that you get to your clay temperature and let it stay there and then you can just you know uh, leave it in uh, for the amount of time and then I usually turn the oven off and let it cool in there too that's mm -hmm. my personal preference but and you can bake inside of an oven bag if you're using your home oven that will that will reduce the amount of polymer residue that's uh, coming off come off gassing and getting mm -hmm. inside your oven so those uh, oven roasting bags like you cook a turkey in are great if not you can use pie tins you can make your own little foil tent or whatever <laughs> um, if you care about that you know if you you're also using that oven for food. 
but mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, but any one of those work out fine, and just spend the extra money, spend your fifty to seventy-five dollars on a decent oven, and you'll be happy that you did. And all ovens do build up smell over mm -hmm. time, so that the more often you use them, the more stinky they get. That's just <laughs> the way that goes. So put it somewhere where you've got some uh, ventilation, and it will work better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. So it's uh it's time for a prize and oh, Lisa yeah. ran uh she ran a random dot org on all the people who submitted their info Wonderful. for Wonderful. us. So we have Deborah Wozniak. You've won a copy. Ooh, of Deborah! Us. Yay! I hope you, you don't already it. have it. If so, just sell it to someone else. Yeah. <laughs> if so, you can message me and I'll see about something else. But because we also That's have uh. Let's talk about the challenge. So we have yes. a pile full of wonderful prizes from Christy Yay. and uh, that she has donated for us to be able to give a prize each month. And um, we also have a couple sort of grand prize things that we're going to save for those of you who decide to create along with us for the entire year. Yeah. Yes. And one of them, I'm just going to... See if I can flash this little dude up in front of my camera. <laughs> He's gonna streak. Flash the boy. Oh, <laughs> um, Christy <laughs> has done video demos for us before on the show. So if you want to go back to Polymer Clay TV, you can see where she made this little dragon dude right here. Isn't he so cute? He is adorable. <laughs> And um, he was made at the Orlando Clay Fandango, which is a yes. retreat in Florida. And he's got all kinds of sparkly things in his wings. He does. He, he, and, I remember uh, that. That was fun. That was a yes. good. That was a good little event. So, and if you're wondering, oops, on it's okay, he's it's Polymer. He's fine. <laughs> <laughs> he was baked properly, so it's all good. <laughs> he was. Um, and I've had him for a long time. I've enjoyed him. Um, I've Aww. never never worn him, although he is um, a pendant that you could string. So he's going to go to a new home, and he's going to go. For someone. Love. To someone who wants to create along with us for the whole year. So Wonderful. be sure that you check below the video for all the details on the create along. And oh, cool. then you can uh, you know, put yourself in the ring to, to win him and to Yay. win lots of other fun prizes along the way. Yep. So Yes, there are all throughout and you guys are going for like how long are we is the challenge going on? Is it all year? It'll be for a year starting now. Wow, exciting, mm -hmm. exciting. <laughs> That's fantastic. I love yeah. it. I love it. So the and you're starting off with Flourish book, I think, we right? We are. We're starting yeah. with Flourish. And, um, I love this book. I hope anybody who has not kind of gotten it yet, you know, take a look. Obviously, you can get it from my website. You can get it from Amazon and other places. But I think it's really chock full of goodies, don't you? So even though it's yeah. it's all plant material, flowers mm -hmm. and buds and pods and things, there's it's all full of technique. I'm mm -hmm. a big fan of not just giving you a project, but having that project incorporate a new technique. So there's a lot of really nifty things from stained glass to, excuse me, swell again to carving, all kinds of fun stuff. Yeah, and you know, if you've never cracked open one of Christie's books, um, they are just, they're not like a typical book. Here, I'll just flash a little bit of this in front of you here. You know, they're full of stuff. Okay, you can see she's got notes in the margins and lots and lots of pictures and all kinds of fun things. And I think if you go to Amazon and you check out Flourish, is there a little preview in there? There should be. Yeah. There should be. If there's not, I'll talk to my people because there definitely should be. Okay. There may even be one on my website if there's mm -hmm. not on Amazon. So, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, Christie's books are full of information and photos and galleries and And I think, don't they get like stuff. a coupon by being part mm -hmm. of your group? They get a discount? Yeah. Yep, yeah, it's right so below check the video. That out. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, well, thank you. <laughs> I, I so appreciate that. I have such a fun time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on the show today and telling us all about you. Oh, you're welcome. You're <laughs> welcome. It was my pleasure. I'm glad you asked me. I'm. I, I know sometimes it's fun to listen to people yammer, and sometimes not. I hope this was <laughs> one of the fun times. <laughs> yeah. Well, everybody's thanking you, and yay! And we everyone. had a really nice comment from our friend Carol, who says we love your craziness. Oh, That's what draws yay. us to you. So. <laughs> well, that ain't going anywhere, Carol. So that sounds good. <laughs> Yeah. I promise to be crazy forever. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much, Christy, and we will oh, um, you're welcome. hear from you and share with you what's going on in the challenge throughout the year. Uh, I will be watching and throwing my two cents worth in throughout <laughs> okay. the year. Absolutely. Okay. Bye, well, everybody. 
Bye. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye.